What if I told you that at the very center of what we call real science, at its very core, lies a mystery unsolved for millennia, based on what you will hear today? I probably wouldn't even be afraid to say that the foundation of all of today's real science is real magic. One morning in December 1998, cosmologist and astrophysicist Max Tegmark received an email that made him break out in a cold sweat. It was from a renowned professor, and here's what it says. Dear Max, your crazy articles are not doing you any good. First of all, by submitting them to good journals and having the misfortune to get them published, you ruin them in the funny side. I am the editor of a leading magazine, and your article would never have gotten past me. This is perhaps not a big deal, except that your colleagues consider these personal characteristics of yours a bad sign as far as prospects are concerned. You must realize that unless you completely separate this activity from your serious research, perhaps by discontinuing it altogether, and bring it into a pub or other such place, you may jeopardize your future. When Tegmark forwarded the letter to his father, he received a reply containing a quote from Dante. Follow your own path. I let people say whatever they want. Tegmark took this advice to heart. Today, the name Max Tegmark is well known to many. He is one of the world's leading popularizers of science, a physicist, a professor at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, an author of several books, and a participant in numerous educational programs. So, what could he have written that incited such anger from the letter's author, potentially threatening Tegmark's career? Simply put, Tegmark was forthright in sharing his views on the nature of our universe. Curious about his perspective? That's the topic of today's video. If you appreciate the content, please show your support by liking, subscribing to the channel, leaving a comment, and sharing this video with your circle. Your engagement greatly aids the algorithm. Renowned neurologist and neuropsychologist Oliver Sacks, in his international bestseller, The Man Who Mistook His Wife for a Hat, recounts 24 case studies of individuals with mental disorders, all drawn from his clinical experience. Among these fascinating stories, one stands out remarkably. Without Sachs' credibility, this story might have been dismissed as unbelievable. It took place in 1966 when Sachs first met 26-year-old twins, John and Michael, diagnosed with various conditions, including psychosis, autism, and severe mental retardation. Since the age of seven, most doctors who assessed them concluded that the twins were savants. These individuals possess extraordinary abilities such as limitless memory and the skill to instantly determine the day of the week for any given date, past, or future. But here is what Oliver Sacks writes. I, however, I believe that there was a mistake, most likely inevitable in the narrow-minded approach of the first researchers who tried to squeeze twins into the rigid framework of standardized questions and tests, and thus reduce their psychology and character, their whole life, to almost nothing. I think that in reality the case of twins is much more surprising, much more complex and inexplicable than the conclusions of any of these researchers suggest, without abandoning the idea of testing the twins and ceasing to treat them as guinea pigs. The existence of depth simply cannot be suspected. True understanding requires not experimentation, but contact. You need to observe the twins in a human way, calmly and without prejudice. You need to open up to their special reality, the natural and original reality of their life and thinking their relationship with each other, and if you succeed, it becomes clear that you are dealing with the fundamental forces of the universe, with a huge universal mystery to unravel, which I did not have all the 18 years of our acquaintance, Oliver Sacks. What is the essence of this matter? I want to emphasize that I will include many direct quotes from Oliver Sacks to ensure you understand that I'm not adding my own embellishments. There are, indeed, many mathematical prodigies with unique method of memorizing and calculating, However, the mystery surrounding the twins begins with something quite surprising in this context. The ability to computational operations, a typical end of all arithmetical geniuses and people, counters. But if you test these abilities in twins, it turns out that the calculations are given to them strikingly poorly, in full accordance with their coefficient of mental development, equal to 60. They add and subtract with errors, and they don't understand multiplication and division at all. What is it? Counters who cannot count, who do not know elementary arithmetic. How can it be possible to perform calculations without actually calculating? Yet, this was only the beginning. One day, I saw a box of matches fall from their table 
and its contents scattered on the floor. 111. They both shouted at the same time, and then John suddenly whispered, 37. Michael repeated the number. John said it a third time, and stopped. It took me a while to count the matches. There were 111. How could you count them so fast? I asked and heard back. We didn't count. We just saw that there were 111. It was from this point in the book that the iconic moment in Rain Man was inspired. 82, 82, 82. 82 what? How much is this? Toothpicks. Why did you whisper 37 and repeat it three times? I asked the twins. 37, 37, 37, 37. 111, they replied in one voice. How did you calculate that? I asked with curiosity. And in response, I again heard confused explanations reduced to the fact that they did not count, but just saw. My response surprised them greatly, as if I were the one who was blind. John's gesture spoke clearly of some directly perceived reality apparent to them. Is it possible, I asked myself, that they were somehow directly seeing the characteristics of numbers, not as abstract attributes, but as concrete properties accessible to the senses? Sachs attempted to make sense of what he observed, but eventually gave up. Then one day, he stumbled upon the twins engaged in a peculiar activity. They were sitting quietly in a corner, smiling mysteriously and appearing blissful. Sachs discreetly approached them and watched. The twins were engaged in a unique numerical conversation. One would mention a six-digit number, and the other would nod, smile, and seemingly savor the number before responding with another six-digit number, which his brother would then accept with deep satisfaction. The twins were like two wine connoisseurs who discovered a rare bouquet during a tasting and savored it. What were they doing? Sachs wrote down all the numbers they exchanged and went home, where he began to study tables of powers, multipliers, logarithms, and prime numbers. He found that all the six-digit numbers the twins had exchanged were prime numbers. But what is a prime number and what makes it special? A prime number is a number that can only be divided by itself and by one without getting a fraction. For example, seven is a prime number because it cannot be divided by any other number except seven and one. Numbers such as seven, 11, and 13 are prime numbers. When it comes to small numbers such as the above, it is easy to determine which number is prime and which is not. Whereas determining whether a number such as 22,171 is prime is much more difficult. However, the twins, despite the fact that they could not make any calculations, exchanged six-digit prime numbers and enjoyed it immensely. The next day, Sachs returned to the hospital with a table of prime numbers. Watching the twins engaged in their usual game, he decided to experiment. Quietly approaching them, he called out an eight-digit number. The twins turned to me and froze with a look of deep concentration and some doubt. The pause, the longest I had ever observed from them, lasted half a minute or more. Suddenly, both of them smiled simultaneously, having performed a dizzying process of internal verification. They saw that my eight-digit number was prime. This made them delighted, doubly delighted. I had given them a new toy, a prime number of a simple number of an order they had never encountered before. After some time, the twins began exchanging 12 and even 20-digit numbers, which Sachs couldn't verify because his table only went up to 10 digits. In the 1960s, verifying such large numbers could only be done by the most powerful computers, and it wasn't an easy task. Furthermore, there was no straightforward method to calculate prime numbers of such magnitude. Yet, the twins managed to do it. I don't think there's any calculations involved at all. Twins, as angels, have access to direct knowledge. They directly discern the arithmetical universe, the vast heavens of numbers. Do we have the right to call it pathology? Oliver Sacks. Do alien civilizations exist? The answer is straightforward and unequivocal, yes. However, according to Tegmark's calculations, the nearest such civilization would be at least a billion, billion, billion kilometers away. Although, with similar probability, aliens could be a billion, billion times farther away. Not a particularly practical calculation, but the key point is that they definitely exist. Here's why. As of this video, the oldest living person on the planet is Maria Brañas Morera, born on March 4, 1907. During her school years, she lived in a vastly different world. 
In class, she likely learned that the entire cosmos was just the solar system and the surrounding stars. However, within her lifetime, humanity's understanding of the universe's size has expanded so significantly that the universe as she knew it in her school days is now just one of several hundred billion galaxies we can observe. This kind of horizon expansion has occurred multiple times throughout human history. Today, we know that space is at least a billion trillion times larger than the greatest distances familiar to ancient hunter-gatherers. Moreover, Max Tegmark states that, according to the most widely accepted cosmological model, the theory of inflation, space is not just vast, but infinite. The theory of eternal inflation aligns with all modern observational data and serves as the foundation for most calculations and models presented at cosmological conferences. What does this have to do with aliens? Given that the cosmos is infinite and uniformly filled with matter, it follows that there must be an infinite number of extraterrestrial life forms in the universe, including some we cannot even imagine. In an infinite cosmos, anything not prohibited by the laws of physics is possible, and the infinite universe is a peculiar place. For instance, if the laws of physics allow for a life form that consumes entire planets, then such entities are guaranteed to exist somewhere. We won't see it all, of course, because due to the finite speed of light and the expansion of the universe, we live at the center of a bubble 93 billion light years in diameter, beyond which space continues but remains unobservable to us. Consider a small toy universe in which there are only four places for identical particles. There are only 16 possible combinations of matter in this toy universe. Now, imagine that there are others of the same kind around this toy universe. The question arises, how often will these combinations repeat? The answer is, to find a repetition, we would need to check an average of 16 neighboring universes. Now, let's apply this concept to our real, observable universe. Of course, there are many more variations in the configuration of matter, but these variations are still limited. According to Tegmark, by the most conservative estimate, there are no more than 10 to the 10th to the 118th degree of possible arrangements of our observable universe. This huge number is a 1 followed by 10 to the 118th degree of zeros. It is so large that if you turned all the matter of the observable universe into ink, you wouldn't have enough ink to write it down in its entirety. And yet this number is tiny compared to infinity. This means that if you look up into the sky in any direction, at a distance of about 10 to the 10th to the 118th degree of the diameter of the observable universe, your exact duplicate, who has lived the same life, will be looking at you. This copy is thinking the same thing and doing the same thing at the same moment. Moreover, your duplicate is on the same planet, in the same solar system, in the same galaxy, and in the same observable universe. The history of his observed universe is identical to ours. Thus, in an infinite universe, there are an infinite number of perfectly identical bubbles, 93 billion light years in diameter. It is easy to realize that there are also an infinite number of bubbles whose histories differ slightly or significantly. According to Max Tegmark, these are parallel universes of the first level. This is often the case in physics. The mistake is not that we take our theories too seriously, but that we don't take them seriously enough. Steven Weinberg, theoretical physicist and Nobel Prize winner. Today, we will explore some unconventional ideas. Some may question the point of debating such metaphysical concepts. But Tegmark suggests that the line between physics and metaphysics is quite indistinct and constantly changing. For instance, we currently understand that the Earth is spherical. But this was once considered a metaphysical theory. Or take the Earth's invisible magnetic field how is that not metaphysical? Consider time dilation and high speeds or particles existing simultaneously in two locations. Warp space and black holes were once part of this metaphysical realm, but are now recognized as physical realities. Thus, the distinction between physics and metaphysics isn't based on the outlandishness of a theory, but rather on the potential for experimental verification. However, not all physicists agree on this perspective. It is becoming increasingly clear that theories based on modern physics can actually be predictive, empirically testable and falsifiable, despite the fact that they include the notion of the multiverse. We will be exploring as many as four levels of parallel universes. And for me, personally, the most interesting question is not whether the multiverse exists, since the existence of its first level is not in doubt. 
but how many levels there are within it. Max Tegmark. Can we set up an experiment to verify that space extends infinitely beyond what we can observe? Tegmark argues that we don't need such a test, because parallel universes resulting from infinite space, along with other parallel universes, we'll discuss today are not theories themselves, but predictions derived from certain theories. Let me illustrate with a simple example. Einstein's theory accurately predicts Mercury's orbit. Can physicists test this? They can, and they do, finding that the predictions match observations with precision at the limits of our measuring instruments. Einstein's theory also predicts that light bends around massive objects due to the curvature of space. Arthur Eddington confirmed this experimentally in 1919. What else? Gravitational time dilation, which has also been experimentally verified. However, the general theory of relativity also predicts phenomena that we may never be able to test experimentally. For instance, it describes certain properties of space inside black holes. How can we test what's inside a black hole? One could theoretically enter a black hole, but transmitting observations back for publication is impossible. Yet, scientists take the theory's predictions about black hole interiors very seriously, and no one would dare to call these predictions unscientific given the extraordinary accuracy of the theory's other predictions. Tegmark writes, An important feature of physical theories is that if you like one of them, you have to buy it complete. You can't say, I like the way the general theory of relativity explains the orbit of Mercury, but I don't like black holes, so I want to do without them. You can't buy the general theory of relativity without black holes. The general theory of relativity is a rigid mathematical construct that does not allow for fine-tuning. You have to either accept all of its predictions or invent from scratch another mathematical theory that agrees with all of the successful predictions of general relativity and simultaneously predicts that black holes don't exist. This turns out to be an extremely difficult endeavor, and so far, such attempts have come to nothing. And by the same token, the theory of inflation has its own testable predictions. It is a very successful theory. And therefore, one should also take seriously those of its predictions that seem unprovable, including infinite space and parallel universes. Even those of my colleagues who dislike the idea of the multiverse are now inclined to admit that the basic arguments in its favor make sense. In general, criticism has changed from it doesn't make sense. And I hate it too. I hate it. Max Tegmark. Physics reveals a reality far more complex than we could have ever envisioned. Is this surprising? Not really. Evolution has shaped our intuition to understand only those aspects of physics that were crucial for the survival of our distant ancestors. Thus, it's shocking to us when liquid helium starts flowing upward at low temperatures. Yet, there's something even more surprising, something so seemingly unsurprising that we never even notice it. And you didn't notice it this time either. The general theory of relativity is a rigid mathematical construct. Isn't anyone puzzled by how the greatest theory in human history was discovered? Did Einstein use a telescope to develop his theory? No. Did he conduct any measurements? Again, no. Instead of conducting observational experiments, he spent nine years at home, working it out on paper. He created symbols and diagrams that most people on the planet are completely unfamiliar with. Nine years. We refer to it as math, and we discuss it as if we fully understand what we're talking about. The most knowledgeable people in mathematics are mathematicians. They openly admit that by and large, they have no idea what mathematics is. As the English philosopher Sir Michael Dummett once said, the two most abstract scientific disciplines, mathematics and philosophy, are equally perplexing. What do they actually do? And this bewilderment is caused not only by ignorance. Even specialists in their respective fields find it difficult to answer this question. But let's ponder that later. Right now, let's focus on something different. Consider gravity. Have you ever noticed anything peculiar about how objects fall due to gravity? Let's drop an object and observe. Take a falling ball. For example, in one second, it covers a certain distance. How far do you think it will travel in the next second? I'll reveal the answer. In the next second, the ball covers three times that distance. In the third second, it travels five times as much. In the fourth second, seven times as much. In the fifth second, nine times as much. Then eleven times as much, and so forth. Take a closer look. What do you find peculiar about this sequence? If you examine it carefully, you'll notice there are no even numbers. The fall of any object follows a sequence of odd numbers, a discovery made by Galileo. 
you can measure these intervals not just every second, but also, for instance, every five seconds or every two minutes. It doesn't matter. Regardless of the time interval, the sequence remains the same. The ball falls as if the universe inherently knows the odd, and therefore, even numbers. This is a strict mathematical law without exceptions. This law is inexplicably embedded in the fabric of the universe. It would be more expected if the ball's fall varied each time. Even Einstein would have been perplexed by this, as he mentioned in a letter to the mathematician Maurice Solovine. He wrote the following. Do you find it surprising that I speak of the cognizability of the world as a miracle or an eternal mystery? Well, one should expect a priori a chaotic world that cannot be cognized by thinking. Meanwhile, in a chaotic world, the brain likely couldn't have developed because, as American neuroscientist Dean Bonomano suggests, if we needed to summarize the brain's primary function, the best definition would be the anticipation of the future. The brain is constantly performing mathematical calculations. For instance, you might not know why you find one face more attractive than another in pairs of faces, but your brain does. It has already done the math. The calculations behind facial attractiveness are so complex that there's an entire YouTube channel dedicated to studying which faces the human brain finds appealing with over 500 videos. So, the perception of facial beauty involves specific numbers, percentages, ratios, and proportions that you might be unaware of, but your brain knows. It performs these calculations and predicts potential for good offspring with that person, which we interpret as attractiveness or beauty. This principle isn't limited to facial features. For example, many women work hard in the gym, doing squats to enhance the volume of their gluteal muscles. However, it appears that the curve of the lumbar region is more critical than the muscle volume. Men find an angle of 45.5 degrees to be the most attractive. You might wonder, why these specific numbers and ratios are significant. Some explanations exist, but many specific numbers in the world remain mysterious. It's unclear why the number pi, the ratio of a circle's circumference to its diameter, which appears in various areas of physics, is exactly what it is. Though everyone is quite familiar with pi, there's a more intriguing story. In 1975, a young mathematical physicist named Mitchell Fagenbaum was given a sophisticated pocket calculator. The HP-65, which, adjusted for inflation, cost nearly $5,000. Fascinated by this new tool, Fagenbaum discovered while studying the behavior of a simple function that the sequence of numbers from his calculations converged closer and closer to a specific number. When Fagenbaum examined other equations, he was astonished to find that this enigmatic number appeared there as well. He concluded that he had discovered a universal regularity that somehow signified the transition from order to chaos although he couldn't provide an explanation. Initially, physicists were very skeptical because there seemed to be no reason for the same number to characterize the behavior of vastly different systems. Fiegenbaum's first paper underwent a six-month peer review process, only to be rejected. However, soon afterward, experiments revealed that numerous phenomena behaved according to Fiegenbaum's findings. For instance, his solution predicts the transition from the orderly flow of a liquid or gas to turbulence, but that's not all. This number also appears in the population dynamics of living organisms, the eye's response to flickering light, atrial fibrillation, and the behavior of water droplets from a faulty faucet. This number is now known as the Fagenbaum constant. Theoretical physicist and Nobel laureate Eugene Wigner once made a statement that later became widely recognized. The incredible efficiency of mathematics and the natural sciences is something bordering on mysticism, for there is no rational explanation for this fact. Have you ever wondered what you are doing when you listen to music? What does it mean to listen to music, and why do we derive so much pleasure from it? In school, we learned about Pythagoras' theorem and Pythagoras himself. However, what wasn't mentioned is that Pythagoras founded a totalitarian sect named after himself. The members of this sect worshipped numbers and believed that mathematics was literally divine. Their motto was, everything is number. This was taken very seriously. When one of Pythagoras' disciples, Hippas, mathematically proved that not everything can be expressed in whole numbers, he was found drowned shortly afterward. Pythagoras discovered that music is mathematical and that specific ratios of vibrating strings are most pleasing to the human ear, specifically two to one. 3 to 2. 
and 4 to 3. These tonal combinations became the foundation of classical music, much of folk music, as well as pop and rock music. Thus, Pythagoras revealed that the harmony of sounds we enjoy mirrors relationships that exist in a seemingly entirely different realm. The world of numbers. But how is this possible? The German mathematician Gottfried Leibniz wrote, The pleasure that music gives us stems from calculus, but unconscious calculus. Music is nothing but unconscious arithmetic. Arthur Schopenhauer believed that everything that exists is an embodiment of the world will, and music is its most direct manifestation. Music, in contrast to the other arts, is the imprint of the will itself. That is why the action of music is so much more powerful and deeper than that of the other arts. For the latter speaks of the shadow, while it speaks of the being, because of the repeatedly confirmed truth of Leibnizovsky's saying, music is nothing but a way to comprehend directly and in reality those large numbers and numerical relations, which in general we can cognize only indirectly in concepts. And here's what's interesting. People with acquired or congenital talent syndrome, like the twins we talked about at the beginning, often have superpowers, not only in math, but also in the same music. This brings to mind. As Oliver Sacks says, random numbers, and indeed any randomness, were no fun for the twins. They were looking for meaning in numbers, probably in a similar way. Musicians look for harmony in sounds. Oliver Sacks. It turns out that there really is a mystical hidden pattern in prime numbers that mathematician Stanislaw Ulam discovered quite by accident in 1963 and that even we ordinary people can see. Ulam sat through a very long and boring presentation. To amuse himself, he started drawing vertical and horizontal lines on a piece of paper to study chess moves. Instead, he started normalizing squares. He placed a one in the center, then spiraled to two, three, and so on, noting prime numbers as he progressed. He found that the prime numbers lined up in a certain harmonious pattern. Intrigued, Ulam returned from the meeting and created a computer visualization of what 90 million prime numbers would look like showing what is now known as Ulam spiral. Why do numbers that divide only by themselves and one form such a beautiful pattern? Alan Guth, a physicist and cosmologist, proposed the idea of cosmic inflation, which predicts the existence of a first-level multiverse. It also predicts the existence of a second-level multiverse. Alan Guth, Andre Linde, Alexander Vilenkin, and other physicists have demonstrated this. In his talk at Massachusetts Institute of Technology, Guth noted that if we discover an object in nature, the scientific approach suggests that we should also find the mechanism that created it. For example, cars are built in factories, rabbits are born with the help of rabbit parents, and planetary systems are formed by the gravitational collapse of giant molecular clouds. Therefore, we must assume that our entire universe was generated by some mechanism for creating the universe. It is important to note that automobile factories, rabbits, and dust clouds generate multiple instances of what they create. A universe with only one automobile, one rabbit, and one planetary system seems unnatural. By this logic, the mechanism that spawned our universe should have spawned many others. A first-level multiverse is a single universe with infinite space where everything eventually repeats itself. But a second-level multiverse is a more intriguing structure. Consider the masses of the nine fundamental particles, the fermions. The scale shows how much heavier each particle is compared to an electron. Remarkably, these nine numbers pass a rigorous statistical test for randomness. It's like someone randomly throwing nine darts at a dartboard, which in itself raises questions. Going even further, imagine you are adjusting the knob responsible for the density of dark energy. Dark energy is a repulsive force in the universe. If it's too high, stars and galaxies can't form. If it's too low, the universe collapses rapidly under gravity. Physicists have calculated that the maximum possible value is about 10 to the 97th degree kilograms per cubic meter. At this value, space would be filled with tiny black holes. The minimum value is 10 minus 97 degree kilograms per cubic meter. How accurately do you think you have to turn the handle for our universe to exist? The answer is that the angle of rotation must be set to an accuracy greater than 120 decimal places. This is almost impossible to do by chance. 
but some mechanism has obviously managed to do this for our universe. The universe has many such finely tuned parameters. Tegmark notes that the scientific community is slowly realizing that many of these parameters are fine tuned. For example, if you reduce the electromagnetic force by about 4%, the sun will immediately explode. How can we explain this? There are three possibilities. The first is a series of happy coincidences, but the scientific method does not tolerate unexplained coincidences. As Tegmark writes, to say that my theory requires an unexplained coincidence to agree with observations is like saying my theory is wrong. The second option is divine intervention, or God. However, this explanation is not much better than the previous one, as it raises many other questions without providing real answers. The third option, inflation theory, assumes the existence of infinitely expanding space. In this model, space inflates like a pot of boiling water forming bubbles. Each bubble represents a first-level multiverse with infinite space inside, and all these infinite bubbles together form a second-level multiverse. You may wonder how infinite space can be contained within the limited volume of these bubbles. To an outside observer, all these universes may appear to be entities smaller than an atom, resembling atom-sized black holes. But to observers inside each universe, their space is infinite. Thus, what we call the Big Bang was not the beginning, but rather the end, the end of inflation in our region of space. In other regions, inflation tends to go on forever. It is worth noting that most second-level parallel universes are stillborn due to a failed setup. When discussing second-level multiverse, Tegmark often relies on a statistical approach, which he claims works brilliantly. The predictions fit the data perfectly. When you think about it, this notion is rather absurd. How can randomness exhibit regularity? It sounds like an oxymoron. Leaving aside the multiverse, let's consider our everyday world. One day, Belgian mathematician Adolf Quetelet decided to conduct a massive study. He began collecting thousands of measurements of various parameters of the human body. For example, he measured the chest circumference of 5,738 Scottish soldiers and the height of 100,000 French conscripts. Despite the fact that he was a peculiar personality, his results were astonishing. By representing all the measurements on a graph, he obtained a bell-shaped curve that we today call the normal distribution curve. The more data he collected on a particular parameter, the clearer the curve became. For example, when measuring height, most people were the same height, with only a few deviating from the norm. Very short people were located on the left side of the graph, and very tall people on the right. Quetelet also plotted similar curves for so-called moral traits, if he had enough data. These traits included marriage rate, propensity to offend, intellectual ability, and more. To his amazement, Quetelet found that all human characteristics followed this normal distribution curve. Over and over again, the same pattern showed up. What is truly amazing is that Quetelet recognized a curve known since the mid-18th century, known to physicists from astronomical observations. How could astronomical, biological, and social processes be linked by some universal law, even though social processes are total chaos? The mere fact that the distribution of a wide variety of properties from weight to IQ, follows the same normal curve is remarkable in itself. But that's not enough. Even the distribution of the average success rate of major league baseball pitchers is more or less normal, as are the returns of stock indexes, which are made up of many individual funds. Moreover, if a distribution deviates from a normal curve, it usually needs to be tested thoroughly. For example, if the distribution of English grades at a school deviates from the normal curve, it suggests checking the grading rules there. Mario Livio, astrophysicist. But that's not all. In 1906, Charles Darwin's cousin Francis Galton made an important observation at a village fair. Visitors were invited to guess the exact weight of a slaughtered bull for a fee, and the guesser received a prize. A total of 787 people took part in the contest, including both knowledgeable farmers and people with no experience in animal husbandry. The winner is not the main thing here. The important thing is that Galton calculated the average of all the responses, which was 1207 pounds. How close was this average to the actual weight of the bull? The margin of error was less than 1%. Seemingly random guesses by different participants resulted in a remarkably accurate estimate. 
the phenomenon was subsequently replicated in various fields. Galton published his findings in Nature, calling this effect collective wisdom. Today, it is known as wisdom of crowds. This effect, for example, underlies the effectiveness of democracy. Although this form of government used to be seen as potentially disastrous, how can a crowd run a state? It turns out they can. This is the principle behind the jury system, where the guilt or innocence of a defendant in serious cases is decided by a group of randomly selected citizens rather than professional lawyers. Various services also rely on the wisdom of crowds, such as Wikipedia and Metaculus, an online prediction platform created in 2015 by scientists and researchers. On Metaculus, people can make predictions about future events, and the platform aggregates the results. Many of these predictions have proven to be very accurate. Can mathematical patterns really permeate all aspects of life? On January 31, 1913, a talented mathematician from Cambridge named Godfrey Harold Hardy received a package of papers with a cover letter. The author claimed to have made significant mathematical discoveries and asked Hardy to publish his work if it was deemed valuable as the author himself could not afford to publish due to poverty. Attached to the letter were 11 pages of technical results covering various areas of mathematics. While many of the deductions were already established mathematical theorems, some were entirely new to Hardy and left him completely baffled. He recalled, I had never seen anything even remotely similar before. One look at these formulas was enough to realize that only a mathematician of the highest caliber could have derived them. They had to be true because if they weren't, no one would have had the imagination to make them up. The mathematician behind these remarkable results was a young man from India named Srinivasa Ramanujan. Despite having no formal math background, never attending a university, and never interacting with established mathematicians, he had achieved incredible mathematical insights. Hardy shared this discovery with his colleague, John Littlewood. Both were convinced they were dealing with a genius who, single-handedly, had traversed the century-long journey of European mathematicians. He faced an almost impossible task, a beggarly Hindu with only his own mind, alone confronting the cumulative wisdom of Europe, Harold Hardy. In the end, Hardy put in a lot of effort and helped Ramanujan move to Cambridge to work together. The problem is that no one still understands the method by which Ramanujan derived his formulas. Hardy said, his ideas of what constituted a mathematical proof were of the vaguest kind. Ramanujan spontaneously produced complex arithmetic theorems that would require a modern computer to prove. These were often leaps from insight to insight, without formal proofs or logical steps in between. As Harold Hardy remarked, it seemed ridiculous to pester him with questions about how he derived this or that well-known theorem when he showed me half a dozen new ones, almost daily. Ramanujan himself claimed that his formulas were not his own work, but were revealed to him in dreams by the goddess Nemagiri, which he would then write down in the morning. He often said, to me, an equation has no meaning unless it expresses the thought of God. Ramanujan passed away at the age of 32, leaving behind 4,000 formulas on 400 pages, along with three volumes of notes filled with remarkably profound theorems, but devoid of commentaries, and most importantly, proofs. In 1976, by pure chance, 130 pages of Ramanujan's notes from the last year of his life were discovered in a box at Trinity College. These notes contained another 600 formulas, again, without any proofs. Almost all of these would later be proven. Of these notes, mathematician Richard Askey said, the work he did in that dying year is comparable to what some great mathematician might have done in a lifetime. His achievements are incredible. If they were described in a novel, no one would simply believe it. Recounting their hard work in deciphering this last diary of a mathematician, Jonathan and Peter Borwein remark, to our knowledge, no attempt at mathematical editing of this length and complexity has ever been attempted before. Mathematician Bruce Byrne said, the discovery of this manuscript caused about as much commotion in the mathematical world as the discovery of Beethoven's 10th symphony would have caused in the musical world. Physicist mathematician Stephen Wolfram, in his article, who was Ramanujan, writes, Ramanujan had complex formulas hiding a story behind them. It is incredibly impressive that he could derive them without computers or other modern tools. When I look at Ramanujan's results, many of them seem like random facts from math. However, work on his records, especially in the last 10 years, shows that they are not random.
On the contrary, it is increasingly found that they are consistent with serious and elegant mathematical laws. The theoretical physicist Freeman Dyson said he had some magic tricks that we don't understand. His notebooks containing summaries of his published and unpublished results have been analyzed and studied for decades after his death as a source of new mathematical ideas. What is most astonishing, and what makes Ramanujan's story relevant to our discussion today, is that his formulas are now used in string theory and in the study of black holes. During his lifetime, terms like string theory and black holes didn't even exist. In a seemingly magical way, by deriving his formulas, he answered questions in theoretical physics that had not yet been asked. Moreover, he had no involvement in physics, only in mathematics. How is this possible? Philosophy is written in that majestic book. I mean the universe, which is always open to our gaze, but it can be read only by those who first master the language and learn to interpret the signs with which it is inscribed. It is written in the language of mathematics and its signs, triangles, circles, and other geometric figures, without which a man could not understand a single word. Without them, he would be doomed to wander in the dark, in the labyrinth. Galileo Galilei. A common explanation for the effectiveness of mathematics in the natural sciences goes like this. People observed the physical world and understood some basic properties of addition, subtraction, and other mathematical operations. For instance, it's clear that if you eat one apple out of three, you're left with two. Similarly, most people will eventually conclude that space has only three dimensions. From this perspective, it's not surprising that math and physics are closely linked. However, the main problem with this logic is that math is effectively used in fields far removed from human perception. Take Einstein, for example. Many believe he received his Nobel Prize for his theory of relativity, but that's not the case. The Nobel Committee stubbornly rejected his nomination for over a decade, despite endorsements from major scientists like Lorentz, Planck, and Bohr's. Why? Various factors were cited, including a lack of experimental data. Again, all of his work was based on complex math, without experiments. On one hand, some members of the Nobel Committee didn't understand the essence of his theory. On the other hand, there was significant skepticism about whether time dilation and space curvature were real phenomena. It's hard to blame them. This continued until the experimental data became undeniable. Even then, the committee, paralyzed by indecision, awarded Einstein the Nobel Prize, not for his theory of relativity, but, as is widely believed, for his relatively minor achievement, the explanation of the photoelectric effect so, why is math so adept at describing things humans have not encountered throughout history? Why, for instance, does the unreachable world of subatomic particles align so well with math learned through counting vegetables and livestock? And why do Ramanujan's formulas, from a man who had nothing to do with physics, find relevance in the most advanced physics concepts a hundred years later? Why, after all, even Ramanujan's mentor, the same Harold Hardy who literally prided himself on the fact that his writings contained nothing but pure mathematics, wrote in his famous book, A Mathematician's Apology. I have never done anything useful. None of my discoveries have contributed either, directly or indirectly, to the increase or decrease of good or evil. Nor have they had the slightest influence on the well-being of the world. And even his formulas have found practical applications, such as the Hardy-Weinberg Law, a fundamental principle used by geneticists to study the evolution of populations. But how is this possible? On the night of September 26, 1983, alarm bells went off in the command center of the early warning system for nuclear missile attacks near Moscow. The computer showed that intercontinental ballistic missiles had been launched from U.S. territory. The level of reliability of the readings was at its highest. All 80 people who were in the command center at that moment were thinking the same thing. Third World War was inevitable. Lieutenant Colonel Stanislav Petrov was on duty that night. His heart was pounding and his breath was short. I couldn't get up from my chair. My legs gave out. According to protocol, Petrov was obligated to report the attack, initiating a sequence of commands that would result in a retaliatory nuclear strike against the United States. I had only a few minutes to report the threat to the country's leadership. The missiles were to explode on our territory in just half an hour. The tens of thousands of nuclear bombs amassed over the years of the arms race were on the verge of being used. 
Many of these were not just atomic but hydrogen bombs. For those unfamiliar with a hydrogen bomb, an atomic bomb serves as the trigger for the reaction in a hydrogen bomb. I felt like my head had turned into a computer. Lots of data. But it didn't form into a coherent whole. No one can say for certain whether the Soviet Union's leadership would have initiated a retaliatory strike if Lieutenant Colonel Petrov had reported the attack. It was quite probable, given the extremely tense situation at the time. Nerves were frayed as it was. The height of the Cold War. Reagan was openly calling the USSR an evil empire and the center of malevolence in the modern world. Just three weeks prior to this incident, the Soviet leadership had issued a somewhat paranoid order to shoot down a civilian airliner flying from New York to Seoul. Due to a navigational error, the airliner strayed into Soviet airspace and was shot down, resulting in the deaths of 269 people, including American Congressman Larry McDonald. Overall, the circumstances were such that both the United States and the Soviet Union were seriously contemplating preemptive nuclear strikes against each other each fearing the other would strike first. The odds were 50 to 50. Consider this. At that crucial moment, the fate of the entire world hinged on a single calcium atom, striking a specific synapse in Lieutenant Colonel Petrov's prefrontal cortex. This event triggered a particular neuron to become excited, sending an electrical signal that initiated a cascade of neural activity. This collective activity encoded the thought, false alarm. I picked up the phone, and reported to the duty officer that the information coming from my command center was false. The computer had malfunctioned. The only option was to wait for the missiles, if indeed launched, to enter Soviet airspace and be detected by radar. This should have happened within 18 minutes, but it did not. In the days following the incident, according to Lieutenant Colonel Petrov's son, his father slept off the shock. Six months later, it was revealed that the malfunction was due to the sun's rays, reflecting off the clouds above the base, which illuminated the satellite. After the Soviet Union collapsed, the world learned about this event. Stanislav Petrov received a prestigious German media award for his public service. At the United Nations headquarters in New York, he was presented with a crystal statuette inscribed with a man who prevented nuclear war. Petrov also received the Dresden Award for preventing armed conflict and starred in a documentary about the events alongside Kevin Costner. This is the known story. However, there's another equally plausible version. The calcium atom that triggered the chain of events in Petrov's brain is a microscopic object governed by the laws of quantum mechanics, meaning it can occupy two slightly different positions. According to the many worlds interpretation of quantum mechanics, the universe split in two on the night of September 26th. In a parallel universe, the calcium atom did not strike the right synapse in Petrov's prefrontal cortex. Petrov made the opposite decision, reported the attack, and nuclear war ensued. We can only imagine what that world looks like now. This scenario resembles a Schrodinger's cat experiment, but on a planetary scale. Hugh Everett's Many Worlds Interpretation of Quantum Mechanics needs no introduction. Much has been said about it, and in the last decade, many physicists have shifted from dismissing it to seriously considering the possibility of an infinitely branching universe. For instance, Tegmark references an informal survey of physicists from 1997, where most favored the classical Copenhagen interpretation, which does not include parallel universes. However, by 2010, no one at Harvard supported it, with the majority now endorsing the multiverse interpretation. Conrad Lorenz said that important scientific discoveries go through three phases. First, they are ignored, then fiercely attacked and finally dismissed as common knowledge. Judging from polling data, having passed the first phase in the 60s, Everett's parallel universes are now between the second and third phases. Max Tegmark. Many people wonder how it is possible to split into multiple copies of oneself without noticing and still feel like the same person. To understand and accept this, we can use a thought experiment. No law of physics forbids creating an exact duplicate of yourself with all your memories. Imagine you fell into a deep sleep and were then cloned using future super technology. If, upon waking, you are not told which of you is the clone, you can never be certain you are the original. Both versions of you will have the same past and will feel like they have lived a long life, even though one of you only came into existence yesterday. In quantum mechanics, objects can exist in multiple places simultaneously, described by a wave function. 
The wave function represents the degree to which an object is present in different locations. The many worlds interpretation suggests that the distinction between micro and macro worlds is flawed. Thus, the wave function should describe not only micro objects, but the entire universe. In other words, the entire universe is described by a single wave function. If a particle can move along all possible trajectories, so can the entire universe. According to the many worlds interpretation, almost any conceivable version of history, as long as it does not violate physical laws, is as real as our own. This might seem unverifiable, but perhaps you can prove it. One potential consequence of the many worlds interpretation is personal immortality. I discussed this in the video. Why does the universe exist? Or why does something exist instead of nothing? Briefly, imagine you are very old, far beyond the average life expectancy in your country. Each day, the probability of living another day diminishes, but it never reaches zero. There will always be universes where you continue to live. Since you cannot experience non-existence subjectively, you will live forever. Of course, few people agree with this aspect of the many worlds interpretation due to its many nuances. However, if one day you find yourself the oldest person on the planet, like Maria Branias Morera, remember Hugh Everett. His work as a whole remains still controversial, but Tegmark believes Everett is right. I believe he will one day be recognized as a genius equal to Newton and Einstein, at least in most parallel universes. The set of quantum parallel universes discovered by Everett is referred to by Tegmark as the third level multiverse. The third level multiverse is quite similar to the first level multiverse. However, while the level one and level two universes exist within our familiar three-dimensional space, albeit very far away, the level three multiverse is different. It exists right here, but is separated from us by an infinite dimensional region known as Hilbert space. This is where the wave function that describes the entire third level multiverse resides. But what exactly is Hilbert space? What is the wave function? These concepts form the very foundation of physical reality. So what are they made of? According to Tegmark, they are made of nothing. They are purely mathematical constructs. Did you really understand that correctly? Nobel laureate in physics, Frank Wilczek writes in his publication for Edge. I have had many different experiences in my scientific career, including some that have brought me into unusual states of consciousness. But I have only had one experience that qualifies as mystical. I was there alone, inside a metal box the size of an airplane hangar, looking down at the equipment that people use to experimentally study the fundamentals of nature. And then it happened. It occurred to me intuitively that the complex calculations I had made with pen and paper could somehow describe this very different realm of existence, namely the physical world of particles, tracks, and the electronic signals produced by the machinery I was looking at. There was no need to choose, as philosophers often do between mind or matter. It was mind and matter. How could it be? Why should it be? And yet, I somehow suddenly realized all of a sudden that it could and should be. The marvelous mystery of the correspondence of mathematical language to the laws of physics is an amazing gift that we are unable to understand and that we may not deserve. In the mystery of space, how the senses deceive us, we discussed why what humans perceive with their senses cannot be objective reality. This viewpoint aligns with cognitive psychologist Donald Hoffman's radical perspective. Whether he is correct is uncertain, but it is widely accepted that our perception of the world is highly subjective. We only see a distorted model of reality created by our brains. This can be tested easily. Does the world you perceive change when you move your eyes or turn your head? In both cases, you are just changing your viewing angle. How does this alter perceived reality? It shouldn't. Try it. Look straight ahead and move your eyes from side to side without moving your head. Then do the opposite. When you move your eyes, the surrounding space seems fixed. But when you move your head, the space appears to move. The same effect can be observed by closing one eye and gently moving the open eye with your finger. The world seems to move as if you were turning your head. This happens because different brain areas send signals to your muscles. As described by 19th century physicist and ophthalmologist Hermann von Helmholtz, this occurs because you are viewing a model of reality projected by your brain, not reality itself. Our internal model of the world is our inner reality. What the external reality actually looks like remains a significant question. 
since we can't experience it outside of our senses. Interestingly, we do have access to external reality through mathematics. While our perception may say we are looking at a solid rock, its mathematical description reveals it is mostly empty space with particles in constant motion. We trust this mathematical description more than our subjective senses because it has enabled the development of modern civilization and technology. Why external reality is described by math remains unknown, a question that has puzzled humanity for millennia. This question is more pressing today than ever. Is mathematics an invention or a discovery? Does mathematics exist independently of the human mind, waiting to be discovered? Or is it merely a human tool? If it seems to you, that it is not so important to know whether we invented math or discovered it. Consider how much the difference between the words invented and discovered becomes loaded if we ask the question differently. What about God? Did we invent him or discover him? Or even more provocative, did God create humans in his image? Or did humans invent God in their own image? Mario Livio. One might wonder what it means for math to exist independently of the human mind. In other words, do numbers exist in reality? It's not about the symbols themselves, as we can create any symbols we like. The question is about what lies behind those symbols, and what lies behind them is something quite suspicious. This suspicion arose several thousand years ago, but was significantly highlighted by Newton. Newton demonstrated that if the distance between two point masses doubles, the force of attraction between them always decreases exactly four times. This discovery showed that mathematical laws apply not only locally on Earth, within the human realm, but also on a cosmic scale. As English physicist James Jeans once said, the universe is arranged as if it was designed by a pure mathematician. Astrophysicist Mario Livio, in his book, Is God a Mathematician? writes, the concepts and relationships that mathematicians study for the sake of pure science without even thinking about their practical application after tens and sometimes hundreds of years, unexpectedly turn out to be solutions to problems that are rooted in physical reality. How can this be? And that's what you've heard already today in the Fagenbaum, Ramanujan and Hardy stories. But these are not some isolated cases. There are a lot of them. The new type of geometries that Georg Friedrich Bernhard Riemann described in his classic lecture delivered in 1854, turned out to be of crucial service to Einstein. They were the ones that allowed him to describe the fabric of the universe, the mathematical language called group theory, developed by the young genius Evariste Galois, solely for the purpose of determining whether certain algebraic equations had roots among the integers, has today become the language of physicists, engineers, linguists, and even anthropologists. The planet Neptune was discovered only after its existence was predicted on paper using mathematical calculations. Complex numbers were introduced centuries before physicists utilized them to describe quantum mechanics. Non-Euclidean geometry was developed decades before the theory of relativity. Albert Einstein wrote on the subject, How can mathematics, a product of the human mind, independent of individual experience, be such an appropriate way of describing objects in reality? Can the human mind then, by the power of thought, without recourse to experience, comprehend the properties of the universe? This remarkable efficiency of mathematics revolutionized the scientific method. Previously, scientists would gather experimental data first and then attempt to describe them using mathematics. Now, the process is often reversed. Mathematical models are constructed first, followed by experiments. Some modern scientists including prominent figures like Roger Penrose, even argue that experiments may not be necessary because mathematical models alone can suffice to deem a theory scientific. Given what we have discussed today, can we blame them? The situation has reached a point where there are equations that work perfectly but cannot be directly connected to our perceived reality. The two foundational theories of modern civilization, the theory of relativity and quantum mechanics, make perplexing statements about reality. The theory of relativity suggests that the flow of time does not exist and there is no present moment. Quantum mechanics is so complex that it has spawned dozens of interpretations since the mid-20th century. Despite this, the equations themselves function flawlessly. Modern physics relies heavily on mathematics to describe the external world. So, what exactly is this external world? 
In Douglas Adams' famous novel, The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, a supercomputer is asked to find the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. After 7.5 million years of computation, the computer's answer was 42. 42, Lunkul shrieked. That's all you can say. After 7.5 million years of work, I have checked everything very carefully, said the computer, and I can say with certainty that this is the answer. Max Tegmark considers this answer to be quite fitting. Recall the scathing letter to Tegmark mentioned at the beginning of the discussion. In the controversial article that provoked such a strong reaction from the professor, Tegmark proposed the idea that our entire physical world is a giant mathematical object. He suggests that the problem of the remarkable efficiency of math only arises when we treat math and physics as two separate, independent disciplines. However, if we assume they are one and the same, everything makes sense. If two structures are equivalent, there is no meaningful context in which they are not the same thing. If some mathematical equations describe both our external physical reality and a mathematical structure, then our external physical reality and that mathematical structure are one and the same thing. Max Tegmark. The belief that mathematical objects exist in reality and are even more real than what we observe dates back to Plato and is known as Platonism. According to Tegmark, his experience in physics classes has convinced him that Plato was right. But how can physical reality and math be the same? How can mathematical objects exist in reality? Where are they? Do you see equations all around you? Consider a rock, for instance. It consists of empty space between almost volume-less particles. Can we say these particles themselves are abstract? Actually, we can. Quantum mechanics suggests that subatomic particles are not tiny solid balls, but rather an accumulation of mathematical properties. The very fabric of our physical world its space is a purely mathematical object in the sense that all the inherent properties of space, number of dimensions, curvature, and topology, are mathematical. The stuffing of our physical world consists of elementary particles, which in turn are purely mathematical objects in the sense that all their inherent properties, for example charge, spin, left a number, are mathematical. We have seen that there is something perhaps even more fundamental than our three-dimensional space with particles in it. It is the wave function and the infinite dimensional Hilbert space in which it resides. Both the wave function and the Hilbert space are purely mathematical objects. Max Tegmark. This brings us to the last type of parallel universes, so vast and exotic that all others pale in comparison. The fourth level multiverse consists of entirely separate realities, each adhering to different fundamental laws of physics and governed by different mathematical equations. But if reality is a mathematical structure at its most basic level, what are its parts made of? The answer is nothing. Mathematical structures have no intrinsic properties. The properties of our surrounding world arise not from the properties of these mathematical blocks, but from the relationships between them. Essentially, a table is a table, not because each component possesses the property of a table, but because these components are arranged in a particular way. In other words, a table is more than the sum of its parts. However, the significant difference with the blocks that make up the universe is that while the material of a table has some properties, the fundamental blocks of the universe have no properties at all. Therefore, nothing specific can be said about them. You can only speak meaningfully about the relationships between these blocks not about the blocks themselves. If this concept is difficult to imagine, you are not alone. In Penrose's book, The Road to Reality, in a paragraph with the telling title, Is Plato's Mathematical World Real? Penrose writes, I realize that many readers will find it difficult to imagine mathematical structures endowed with any truly independent existence. To such readers, I would like to make one simple request. Try to expand slightly the scope of the usual meaning of the word existence of course. Mathematical forms in Plato's world do not exist in quite the same way that ordinary physical objects, say tables and chairs, exist in our world. They have no spatial location, nor do they exist in time. I guess there's a lot to ponder here. Interestingly, if Tegmark is correct, despite its apparent complexity, the universe is incredibly simple and contains almost no information. Consider the Mandelbrot set, a beautiful mathematical structure. This set contains complex patterns on any number of small scales. While many of these patterns appear similar, none repeat. The set can be magnified infinitely, 
giving an impression of infinite complexity. However, but Mandelbrot's set is completely described by the formula z squared plus c. That is, the entire complexity of the universe can be generated by rather small equations. This is reminiscent of how Maxwell condensed four volumes of experimental results on light and electromagnetism into four simple formulas, now commonly printed on t-shirts. The question remains, how do we fit into this mathematical picture of the world? Mario Livio questions. Perceptual consciousness itself, the abode of conscious perception, unknowingly originates precisely in the physical world. But how exactly does matter give rise to consciousness? And how does it literally give rise to consciousness? Will we ever be able to formulate a theory of the workings of consciousness as coherent and convincing as, for example, our current theory of electromagnetism? This is where the cycle miraculously closes. Due to some mysterious mechanism, the perceiving consciousness has access to the mathematical world, since it is it that either discovers or creates and formulates the whole treasury of abstract mathematical forms and concepts. Indeed, it is not entirely clear how math is related to our brains. It is known that ants and bees can count. Some spiders count the number of insects caught in their webs. Animals can easily add and subtract small numbers. Rhesus macaques and parrots can work with numbers up to six. Pigeons can solve subtraction problems like 12 minus six correctly. Lionesses estimate the number of roars from another pride to decide whether to attack or retreat. Almost all animal species studied can distinguish the number of objects in sets or sounds in a sequence. Moreover, experiments have shown that monkeys, crows, and bees understand how to handle zero and can place it correctly on a number line. Five-month-old babies have been experimentally proven to solve problems like one plus one and two minus one, developing this ability before speech skills. Clearly, there is some selection pressure here, suggesting that at least rudimentary math skills are innate and that there is an evolutionary aspect to our math abilities. But can instances like savant twins or Ramanujan be explained in evolutionary terms, or more generally our deep understanding of math that far exceeds any natural applicability? How are brains shaped by the African savanna capable of comprehending concepts that have nothing to do with that savanna? I remain perplexed as to why mathematical laws must necessarily describe the physical world with such phenomenal accuracy. And if it were only about accuracy, but no, the subtle complexity and mathematical beauty of successful theories are no less mysterious. It is still absolutely incomprehensible how, in a certain way, organized physical matter, here I mean a living, human, or animal brain, the mental quality of meaningful awareness suddenly appears out of the blue. And finally, it is also still unclear in what cunning way a person evaluates the truth of a mathematical statement. This mental quality cannot be explained only by the fact that our brains are supposedly programmed to perform certain calculations correctly. There must be something else besides calculations, something that allows even the most worthless mathematician to intuitively grasp the actual meaning of, for example, concepts such as zero, one, two, three, four, and so on. Roger Penrose. So what are we within Max Tegmark's mathematical universe? Hypothesis. We are the unchanging mathematical spatio-temporal patterns of the universe. From our perspective, for example, the Earth and the Moon appear as two balls of rock orbiting each other in space. However, from the perspective of relativity, they look very different. Einstein's theory shows that time is not an abstraction and every point in the past, present, and future exists in reality, in the truest sense of the word. Thus, the Earth and the Moon, when dropping one spatial dimension, look like this. They create a simple, unchanging pattern in space-time. The path of an object in four-dimensional space-time is called its world line, and most inanimate objects have fairly simple and straightforward world lines. However, everything changes when we consider living objects. Even if you are sitting still, Complex biochemical reactions are occurring inside you. Blood cells circulate throughout the body, and nerve impulses travel through the brain. All of this forms a structure in space-time that resembles an intertwined braid, but much more complex. This is what a meeting between two friends looks like. This is how a child is born to parents, and this is what death looks like. Of course, these are shown in animation, but from the viewpoint of the theory of relativity, these are static, eternal, and unchanging objects like everything in the four-dimensional universe. 
As Tegmark writes, the human world line is undoubtedly the most complex pattern in our observable universe. For example, the spatio-temporal pattern of a human being is much more complex than that of an entire sun. Complexity is the hallmark of life. Furthermore, Everett's quantum mechanics endows us with an even more interesting structure, where each of us can branch out like a tree, forming intricate patterns in an infinite mathematical universe. Regarding consciousness, Tegmark suggests that it is the way information feels when it is processed by certain complex methods. Consciousness arises when a model of yourself and your brain interacts with a model of the world in the same brain or with yourself. How does the possibility that all my actions and all the actions of my friends are ultimately governed by these kinds of mathematical principles really make me feel? I think I can bear it. I think it is even preferable for me to believe that all these actions are governed by something existing in some objective sense in Plato's ideal mathematical world, rather than to allow myself to be convinced that human behavior is entirely determined by simplistically nihilistic motives like greed, aggressive cruelty, or the pursuit of pleasure, which is the worldview that many people assure me should be the only result of a strictly scientific approach. Roger Penrose. The hypothesis of a mathematical universe is fundamentally testable and falsifiable. It can be refuted if physicists lacking a complete description of physical reality stop finding mathematical regularities in nature. The four levels of multiverse, of course, have their critics who make strong, refuting arguments. And this is what Max Tegmark responds to. How do I feel about these criticisms? Strangely enough, I agree with all the assertions. And yet, I will gladly bet my entire life savings on the existence of the multiverse. And, you know, it's hard not to respect a man who isn't afraid to express such ideas openly in the often snobbish scientific world. Whether Tegmark is right or wrong, math remains a great mystery that we may still need to solve. This video is inspired by his book, Our Mathematical Universe, and Mario Livio's book is God, a Mathematician. Both are recommended readings. In the history of different peoples, magic is a rather complex system of knowledge, sometimes studied for a lifetime. Magic is mysterious in itself and gives superhuman abilities to those who comprehend it. Adepts of magic believe that behind the reality that we observe there is a hidden, or occult level, and that they, as possessors of special knowledge, can penetrate this level and subdue the world to their will. Magic is often seen as the exact opposite of science, but if you replace the word magic with math in the mentioned paragraph, does its ultimate meaning change? Perhaps, as children in math class, we would all be a little more interested if we were told that the subject is called math only in our universe and even then by some silly mistake. Asking why math is necessary in today's world is similar to asking why magic is necessary in Harry Potter's world. Thank you so much for staying until the end of the video. For your likes, subscriptions, and for supporting my channel with bonuses, thanks for watching.